Hi folks, the talk will start at 7.30, so just hang on for a little bit. Okay, and where do I find the sound? The preferences. Um,
Hi folks, just a few more minutes, we'll get started at 7.30. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our talk tonight, Finding and Appreciating Bear Area Plant Galls by Michael Hawk and Mirav Monchak. I am Vivian New, and I will be your hostess tonight. Um, so welcome. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, the Amamutsin Tribal Band, the Tamiya Nation, and the Ramayatush Ohlone. They still live and thrive in this area today, and we hope to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. If you are joining us for the first time, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you don't mind, please share that in the chat. And this is both for those of you who are on YouTube and on Zoom. And our talks are not just uh, me and our speakers. We also have a team of people who are supporting us. And so tonight, that is me and um, Stephanie Morris and Barbara Hunt. And we also have Madeline Morrow um, helping as well. And our speakers are Michael Hawk and Marav Bonchek. Uh, if you are not familiar with CNPS, we are a nonprofit environmental organization that was founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members in 35 chapters, which are spread all over California. And we actually even reach beyond not just the state, but the nation, because we have a chapter in Baja, California as well. Our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, which covers Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County as well. Um, our mission is to save California's native plants and their habitats through science, education, and conservation and gardening. If you're not currently a member, we would love to have you join us. This really helps um, us support programs like this as well as do our important conservation work. Um, and once you join, in addition to supporting us, you will also receive two amazing journals, Artemisia and Flora. Artemisia has more of a scientific bent, lots of really interesting information about native plants and their habitats. And then Flora is an absolutely beautiful magazine um, covering a lot of general interest um, articles about native plants. You'll also receive our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which tells you about our upcoming events as well as has articles of local interest. And you get discounts at participating local nurseries. So if you are not currently a member, please do consider joining and you can do that at cnps.org join. 
Our chapter has quite a lot going on this weekend, well, actually over the next several days. So on Friday, we are having our monthly photo group meeting. If you are a photographer, um, you are welcome to share pictures there. I think they have one more opening um, for sharing. But if you just enjoy looking at pictures, please feel free to join. It's a public meeting and um, a lot of fun. You can find out more about it and how to join on our website, cnps-scv.org. Um, we also have habitat restoration going on at Lake Cunningham on Sunday, uh, I'm sorry, on Saturday and a field trip at Edgewood Park on the um, Covering Oaks there. And then it is already fall. And on Sunday, we'll be celebrating that with our first day of fall bird and plant ID walk at Lake Cunningham. So if that sounds interesting to you, please go to our website or meet up and you can find out more about all of those activities. And our chapter turns 50 this year, or maybe we've already turned 50 this year. At any rate, we are get, throwing ourselves a celebration October on October 8th. It's going to be at the Dana Center at Hidden Villa in Los Altos. There's more information on our website at cnps-scv.org, 50th-anniversary. And that will also include our fall plant sale. So not only our nursery, but the Grassroots Ecology Nursery will be selling plants. Um, we will be doing the same thing we've done the past couple of years where we'll have our online nursery stores open in advance of the, the actual day of the sale. And so this year you can shop at home in advance, know what you're going to get, and then show up and have a lot of fun with us on October 8th. So I hope you can join us. Um, as I mentioned before, we are going to have the sale online. So that sale is actually going to start at 8 in the morning on September 29th. Um, next week, you can actually go to the nursery to get a view of what we have available, but you won't be able to buy anything until 8 o'clock on September 29th. So if you see something you want, make sure you're awake at, the, on, at 8 o'clock in the morning on September 29th, because things do sell out. We, there are only limited supplies of some plants, and um, just trust me, you probably want to be there at the beginning if there's something you particular, you see something you particularly want. All the proceeds from all of our sa the sales um, will go towards supporting our chapter. So we really appreciate your purchases and um, we just hope, I hope you can stop by and check it out. If you want to find out what's going on, we do send out a weekly message to let you know what's coming up and you can join our news mailing list. Um, the information, it's a Google group. The information to do that is here on the screen, or you can simply go to our website, cnps-scv.org, and there's information on how to do that. Um, but that will keep you up to date and notified of whenever we schedule things, like this wonderful talk tonight. And um, before we get started on the talk, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please make sure your microphones stay muted. If you have questions, please type them into the chat at any time. You can do that both on YouTube and on Zoom. We are monitoring both um, chats and we will um, be reading the questions to our presenters. Um, they'll be taking a, a little bit of time to answer some questions in the middle of the talk and then we'll get to all of them um, at the end, all the rest of them at the end. And we do expect to finish by nine o'clock. And as I mentioned before, the talk is both on YouTube and here on Zoom. Uh, it is recorded on YouTube. So you, if you want to go back and look at it later, or if you want to let somebody know that they should watch it, you can do that right away because the recording is available immediately. And now for tonight's program, Finding and Appreciating Bay Area Plant Galls, which uh, a talk by Michael Hawk and Marav Vanshak. Uh, they are both amazing people. Michael has a podcast and a blog. Um, he is uh, he. He was with Google, but he's now in into the nature thing full time, um, sharing all this great uh, information with people and getting the word out about all the important things we need to know about the environment. And Marav uh, was a professor at uh, San Jose State, and she is very active with BioBlitz. So the BioBlitz Club, uh, which the link. Um, is, was on the description for the talk for both uh, Michael's podcast and his website and Marav's um, BioBlitz Club. They are both wonderful, amazing, amazing people. I am so excited to have them here to talk about galls with us tonight, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for being here with us. 
Okay, thanks, Vivian. Um, okay, let me share my screen quickly. Oops. Well, not so quickly, I guess. Okay. So, hopefully now you can just see the presentation. Yes, awesome. Okay. So let's get started. We have plenty of stuff to show you. So yeah, I'll just get started with the presentation. Okay, so today we will talk about galls, what they are, how they formed, which organisms uh, induce them, how you could find them, how you could decide if something you find on a plant is a gall or not, and uh, some tips on documenting them. Okay, so... I would assume that most people here are botanists and that you've been looking at plants from time to time. Uh, and you probably notice when you see oaks, for example, that they have all these weird apples like this. But obviously, oaks don't actually grow apples, they grow acorns. So other than the acorns, the leaves and the twigs, everything else you see on an oak could potentially be a gall. Um, and those are some really cool little structures with a really interesting story. But of course, these are not the only ones you can find on oaks. If you look closely, you'll find much more interesting little structures with really beautiful colors and shapes. And you just need to kind of stop and look carefully, which I guess is something botanists do. As an entomologist, I never get anywhere when I go hiking. I just walk very slowly and look at different things. And I know some of the people on this uh, presentation and I think you do the same thing. So you probably noticed this before. Um, okay, so what are they? So galls are a structured growth on plant tissue. Uh, they're produced by the plant host in response to a mechanical or chemical stimulation by uh, the gall inducer. Um, it's induced by an adult or a larva of insects or mites or by a fungi. The mechanism uh, varies according to the plant and the gall inducer. So galls are forms uh, mostly on leaves, stems, petioles, and branches, but also on buds, flowers, seeds, roots, and fruits. And you could see some local examples here. Uh, the common types of galls, like stem galls are um, divided into detachable stem galls or integral stem galls. And leaf galls, there are many different types. Some uh, of the simple ones are leaf roll galls or leaf fold galls, for example. Uh, there are also pouch galls, bead galls, erinium galls, and I'll, I'll mention a few of these later. When we look at the host plants, you could see, so using a uh, wonderful uh, gold uh, guide by Russo from 2021, you could see that some plants are incredibly popular hosts, the super hosts, just like on Airbnb. They have plenty of gold inducing uh, organisms on them, especially oaks, but also willows, cottonwood, crescent bush, if you go to the desert, rabbit brush, sagebrush, Coyote brush, rose. So there are different plants that have more species and often more individuals. So of each species, you could find lots of different galls of the same species on one tree, for example. Uh, other plants uh, genera might have fewer uh, species, but are still very interesting and contribute to this amazing uh, biodiversity. It's important to say that the gall inducers are highly specific uh, and often the, you could find a specific wasp only uh, on a specific oak or on a specific host plant. And for example, if we talk about these um, uh, gall wasps that induce galls on oaks, like all these different photos in, uh, in this slide. So these are all somewhat closely related wasp, but uh, you, you don't find them randomly on oaks. Uh, for example, the ones with the red um, uh, frames 
are found only on coast live oak. And then the ones with a blue uh, frame are found on valley oak. The ones with the green uh, frames are found on blue oak. And the purple ones on scrub oak or leather oak. And then some are found on canyon live oak. And you might notice some uh, pattern here. So if you look at gulls, and for me as an entomologist, that was a gate into uh, plants and oaks, especially because I was really interested in finding these uh, gulls and learning more about them. And that's how I learned my oaks, because before that, my botanist friends would tell me, oh, this is the black oak, this is a, a white oak, but I just didn't get it. it. It just kept mixing in my mind. But once I started looking at the gulls, it all made sense because some of these gulls uh, could actually be found on more than one oak species. For example, um, you could see that the ones with a red frame are not only on coast live oak, but you could find them sometimes on other black oaks, like a California black oak, for example. And the ones on white oaks could, many of them could be found on more than one uh, oak. So you could find the same species on a valley oak or a blue oak, and sometimes even on scrub oak, because these species are more closely related than uh, a valley oak and a coast live oak, for example. And the same with the canyon live oak that can share uh, galls with other intermediate oaks. Okay, so that really helped me learn my plants. And if you know your plants, that could help you learn your galls. And I think that's really cool and useful. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the gall inducing organisms now. And this is just a partial list. So we have three different families of uh, fungi that induce galls. We have mites, which are arachnids, aphids, moth, uh, gall midges, soulflies, gall wasps and some beetles and, and quite a few of fruit flies. And I'll give uh, some more examples and more information about some of these groups now. Uh, okay, so let's start with the mites. Uh, mites are tiny arachnids closely related to ticks. And these specific mites are microscopical mites. This is a photo I took uh, using my microscope a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the galls that they form are pretty similar. You can see that they kind of look like a little bump on one side of the leaf and often on the other side, you'll see little brown hairs. For example, uh, the arenium mites look like that. So you'll have all these hairs on the other side. And only if you dig, dig very deeply, you might find these tiny, tiny mites that actually don't look like other mites. They have less legs and this elongated body shape. Uh, it's a very diverse group and we don't know much about them. Uh, kind of like other gall inducers, we just don't know enough about these organisms. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this presentation and why we decided to do gall week, which I'll um, uh, talk about later. Okay, so the next group is aphids. Um, as botanists, you probably know what aphids are, little insects that feed on plant sap. Uh, some of them have complex life cycles uh, and some of them induce galls. So this is a really cool gall that is pretty common in um, cottonwood, uh, Freeman cottonwood in our area. And it's kind of cool because it, these are the, the aphids, okay? They're really tiny. They uh, develop inside the gall. And naturally the gall at some point would open up a little slit where the aphids could go in and out, but also ants can go inside. These are Argentine ants. They can go inside and take care of the little aphids inside. Um, moss. So there are three different families uh, of moss that can induce galls. Um, and the, gall, the galls are induced by the lava. Some of them are stem galls, like this common one you could find on coyote brush. Other create something that kind of looks like a taco or a wrapped candy, whatever you want to call that. Um, not all of them are described. So you'd notice that when you start looking at galls, you might find some that have you know, a scientific name, even a common name. But then many, many don't because we still need a scientist to sit down and rear them and see what kind of insect comes, comes out of that. 
and describe a new species because many of them are new species even in our area with so many people you know study everything uh there's probably even a quarter of the species that is still unknown so these for example are unknown we just know the family of moths um okay the next group is the gall midges it's a huge family of flies that induce galls and you can see that they look pretty different from one another they have a uh, wide diversity of host plants as well, many different species worldwide and in North America. Um, and the galls develop when the lava starts feeding on the gall, and I'll explain in a couple of slides why that's uh, interesting and important. Uh, some of the species in this family uh, are inquilines or even predators, so they don't induce the galls, but they have other um, uh, role in in this system and again i'll get back to this point in a minute and explain what these terms mean um the next group is the soulflies soulflies are primitive wasps and you could find them on willow uh, plants for example both as reliving uh, lava that feed on the plant which are pretty cool by the way i hope you saw these uh, from time to time, but you can also find them as gall inducers. There are many different kinds of galls on willow. So this is one that is induced by uh, the willow apple gall soulfly. Um, and they uh, feed on these galls. They can have a few different generations per year. And in this case, it's interesting because the soulfly female is the one that is inducing the gall. So once she lays her eggs on the host plant, the gall would start forming. So even if something happens to the gall and or to the insect, to the larva, the gall would be there anyway because it was induced by the egg. Um, and that's not the case with some of these other groups. So basically it means that if you open a gall, it could be empty because the larva could have been dead for a long time. Okay. Um, the next group is the gall wasps, the cynipedes. This is a very large group of uh, wasps uh, found in uh, hundreds of species in North America. Most of the species develop on oaks, but there are some species that develop on roses. Uh, and in this case, the gall is induced by the developing larva. And unlike what we saw on willow, uh, if something happens to that larva, that will affect the shape uh and size and everything else of the gall itself because the larva is the one inducing it uh unlike what we saw with so flies okay um so if the larva dies the gall won't oh if the egg dies the gall won't develop but if something happens to the larva it could mean that the gall would just look different uh they induce complex galls and they always have an internal chamber so when you open the gall sometimes that could help you uh, decide if that's a gall wasp or something else um, they can have either one lava in each gall you could see that some of them are really tiny like little pumpkin galls that you could see on coast live oaks and some are larger with multiple lava inside and it could be that we only know about 75 percent of the species in our area so if you wanted to find new species, no need to travel far away. You could just, you know, look at something that nobody's interested in. Or oh, I guess most people are not interested in. Okay, more about gall wasps, because their biology is so interesting. So some of them have alternate generations, which means that uh, they have two different generations. In the fall generation, which kind of starts in the summer, um, they have this these galls that have to survive through winter okay these are the unisexual generation with only females inside and this is correct for some of the species okay it's a large group and there's uh, lots of diversity within this family of wasps but for some of them uh there's unisexual generation in uh the fall and uh, summer and i'll show you a diagram in a second i think it will make it more clear um, the spring generation, on the other hand, has very good growing conditions because the plant uh, is uh, growing quickly, so it gets lots of nutrients, uh, they are short-lived, they develop very fast, uh, and inside they often have bisexual or sexual generation with both males and females. 
I think it's really interesting that um, the alternate generation gulls of the same species usually look different and even the wasps could look different. So a female wasp from the fall generation and a spring generation of the same species look different, which kind of gives us a hint why it was so difficult to get the taxonomy correct for this group. Uh, and they can also induce galls on different parts of the plants, which is also really interesting, like in this example from uh, coast live oak. So this is one of the common species you find on coast live oak. It's called live oak apple gall. Um, and let's look at the summer or fall generation. When they're fresh, they're bright green, then they kind of turn brown and stay on the tree for a long time. So you could see some of the old galls. And by the way, something that helps us tell if something is a gall is if they have exit holes, because at some point this wasp, if everything was right, they'll leave the gall and, and make little holes in it. Um, so in the summer, we have this unisexual uh, uh, generation. Uh, and at around January or March, we have females that would emerge and they would reproduce partanogenetically without any males. Um, and those are the ones that had to survive through winter. So it's, I think, an amazing strategy that they don't need to find a partner in order to mate. They just lay eggs. So they would lay their eggs on a different part of the plant. This is a stem gall and this one is a leaf gall. They lay their eggs in the developing uh, buds of the leaves. Um, and these galls will, again, uh, form pretty quickly and will have both males and females inside. And between May and June, these little wasps will emerge and then they uh, meet and mate quickly and die. That's the end of the life cycle. Uh, the females will lay their eggs on stem buds that would turn into these really cool galls that will only have females that would then emerge uh, at the end of winter, okay? So, what else? This is not the end uh, because the gall inducing wasp is not alone. Um, there are different predators that would actually try and target these tiny little larva inside the galls. For example, birds like woodpeckers and other um, uh, kind of birds could try and peck on these galls and, and get the larva from the inside. Um, in addition, they might have inquilines, which uh, are usually closely related species. So again, gall wasps that kind of share the gall. They're like a roommate that wasn't invited into the party, but you know, is there anyway. Uh, this is one of the galls that we cut during some workshop. And you could see the gall inducing uh, lava in the middle. So this is the lava. This is the species that created this gall. Okay, and this is an inquilin. This is another species that is, you know, sharing the space with the host. Um, the inquilin is usually not a parasite. It won't feed on the lava. It might kill it, though. So, you know, it's an annoying roommate that usually is not too bad. In addition, we have parasites that are actually there to feed on the lava that is inducing the gall. Um, and they would often change the way the gall would look like even more than an inquilin would, okay? Because they kill the lava. Um, and they belong to a different group of wasps. Uh, they, they lay the eggs directly into the gall. Uh, what you see here are some deformed galls. So this is the red cone gall wasp. You've probably seen those on valley oak. They're very common. But sometimes when you see them, you see other gulls that kind of look similar, but are not exactly the same. Uh, this is a spine turban, one of the cutest gulls you can find on valley oak. Uh, and often they look slightly different. So I can't tell you for sure that there's a parasitic wasp inside, but something changed the way that this gull was formed. Okay, and it, there could be a, a, a parasite larva inside. and Pretty soon, I think probably around this time of the year, if you go out and look uh, for galls, you might see one of these inquilines or parasitic wasps trying to get into the little lava inside the gall. Okay, so the, these are different wasps trying to parasitize or lay their eggs into an existing gall so that their lava could benefit from this existing structure. 
Um, the little larva inside the gall actually has some defense mechanisms like secreting honeydew. So in addition to making the plant create a little sheltered home for them and providing food and everything else, they can make the tree, in this case a valley oak, uh, secrete honeydew uh, from the gall that will attract ants and uh, often wasps. So if you see uh, yellow jackets and other wasps flying around the valley oak now, this should uh, direct you uh, to honeydew gall wasp, which is a gall that uh, produces honeydew. And we think that the constant activity of ants and wasps around this gall uh, probably interferes with parasitic wasp activity and makes it more difficult for them to parasitize these galls. And there are plenty more to say about this. Uh, we could go on and on, but I'd like to um, switch to the next group now. So let me stop sharing my screen and then my code. Okay, this will give us a chance to take a breath. So much information. And I will get my sharing going. Okay, does that show up? Marav, thumbs up? Okay. So, in just a couple minutes, we'll take a break and answer a few questions because I know I've seen some popping up that uh, are definitely worth answering. But before we get there, I wanted to talk a little bit about fungi-induced galls. And as cool as the wasps are, I think that these are also pretty interesting. And there's actually, first of all, there's fossil evidence showing fungi-induced galls from over 200 million years ago. And that's earlier than the first insect in gall fossils that have been found. So as is often the case, it seems like fungi figured this out first. And as Marav said earlier, there are three primary families of inducers that are covered here. And when we take a look at them, sorry, I'm just re still rearranging my screen. Okay. Um, when we take a look at them, there's a exobasidium fungi named that because the spores are actually produced on the host plant's surface. There's also rust fungi and sac fungi, which uh, the latter are those leaf curl galls shown here. There's just to be, you know, Full disclosure, there's also a powdery mildew that causes witch's room that's considered a gall. And I suspect there's probably other groups elsewhere in the world as well that, uh, that do induce galls, but we're just talking about these three primarily because this is what we generally find. So let's take a look at the coyote brush rust as an example. And what we see here is a stem swelling, which is characteristic of this type of gall. And you see spores that are actually erupting from the inside of the tissues of the stem. But how do fungi gain such an integral foothold in this plant? It's pretty crazy when you see it. Sometimes these can actually be quite large. Unlike insects, they aren't coming along and inserting an egg into the plant tissue. So what's going on here? So I would say never underestimate the power of mycelia. They can actually be quite strong penetrating hosts, even healthy ones, though there is some documentation that wounded plants, the, those wounds can be more susceptible to this. So like everything else, um, you know, it, it does vary. And I think that there's a problem here with my, yeah, with my slides, I totally skipped the slide somehow. I'm not sure how that happened, but what I, what I neglected to say is that, um, fungi gallers have a biology that's pretty similar to what you would see of other parasitic fungi. So they do need spores to reproduce and they need proper conditions to germinate. And then they do sprout those tiny thread-like hyphae that turn into the mycelia that I mentioned a moment ago. So back to this. Sorry about that. So now back on track. Uh, let's take a look at one other interesting fungal gall as an example of how these may manifest. So I found this crazy looking one on a toyon leaf at Frank Rains Park. Uh, you may be familiar with it. It's over in Del Puerto Canyon. And it was about, I'd say, a, one and a half centimeters. And that's the gall, not the plant. That was an attempt at a joke. Uh, so this is believed to be a gymnosporangium fungi. It's a type of rust. And those spikes coming out are like tubes of spores. In fact, some people call them spore tubes. And it's characteristic of this genus. 
And to me, I think it's kind of cool looking because you can imagine it's almost like one of those Play-Doh fun factories where you push down on the handle and the Play-Doh comes out and it just extrudes through um, out here. But what uh, one of the things that was interesting about this is this genus hadn't been previously documented on a Toyon before. So it's part of the mystery that Marav was alluding to. There's so much to discover with gallers, not just the insects, but also the fungi gallers. So it's unclear if this is just an undocumented species or it's an existing known species that has just not been documented on a Toyon before or something totally else and totally new. Um, you know, unfortunately, when I went back this year to try to find this, it, it wasn't occurring. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can find it again. So with that, uh, I think this is the point where we're gonna pause for some questions. There's a lot to take in. Um, I will stop sharing temporarily. And the moderators can help with the questions. Stephanie, I think is here to read out the questions. I think yes, have... hello. We don't have that many questions yet. So I was just in the process of typing in the chat a request for more questions. <laughs> but the first question that we do have here is how are galls induced? That's a curious verb. I'll start, and I think Marav can add detail. Uh, so the reason why we say induced is because these organisms are actually, for lack of a better term, maybe um, tricking, you know, at trying to pick something other than induce in my definition, uh, tricking the plant into growing the structure that helps the organism in its life cycle. So, uh, so we say induce because um, you know, the, the insect isn't growing this structure. The plant is doing it. The plant wouldn't have grown it if it hadn't been for this organism coming along and doing its thing. And then there are different ways that they can be induced. There's not a single pathway. So Marav, I don't know if you want to um, build upon that. You're muted. Thank you. I was reading all these other questions. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll trust you <laughs> with that. So. Oh, well, I'll, I'll finish. I, I was I was thinking that you could build a little bit more, but some of the things that, that you mentioned in the first half of uh, of this uh, presentation was that um, uh, soft flies will induce the gall at the time that the that the egg is laid. Um, and so something's happening there. There's some chemical that is maybe changing genetic expression. Uh, you know, something interesting is happening there. Uh, wasps, wasps are different. Um, most of the centipede wasps require the larva to start doing its thing. And that's where, um, the, you know, the plant's expression changes and the gall starts to form, um, you know, creating this nice home with all the food inside. Uh, and then, and we talked about fungi, um, how it's induced in a very different way, how it gains an internal foothold within the plant. Great. I'll read off. I got a couple more questions here now. So I'll read off the next one. Why are oaks such a super host? That's a great question. I think the hypothesis is that both we have a high diversity of oaks in the area, um, and that helps with that. But other than that, I'm not sure why that's so great, because that's definitely not the whole answer. Um, I'm not sure, Michael, do you know of another hypothesis? Uh, I, I don't know of another hypothesis. I know that in general, oaks are uh, just um, support an amazing diversity of insects and um, you know not just gallers, but uh, other types of herbivory. Uh, there, there's a great book by Doug Ptolemy, uh, The Nature of Oaks, that's a, a nice, um, uh, it's a pop science kind of introduction to, uh, to oaks. And that's, uh, that's about the extent of my knowledge. Okay. Next question is, besides predator parasite evasion, what selective pressures are hypothesized to influence different gall morphologies? Do any galls seem to offer an enhanced food source for larvae, for instance? I, I was just going to glibly say, I think most of them offer 
a good food source for the larva. But like, I think the question is more about like, do, does one structure or one type have an advantage over a different structure or different type of gall? Maybe that's where the question was going. But if so, I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. But I mean, different groups of gall inducers. So I mentioned like the um, the soulflies and the gall wasps and uh, midges. So they each induce a different kind of gall. So if you open it, it will have a different internal structure. Um, and, you know, each group, I guess, was able to induce a different a different kind of structure that supports their organism inside in a different way. Um, it, it's basically co-evolution between these organisms and the plant, where the plant is just trying to, you know, uh, probably kick them out in a way, and the insects or the gall inducers uh, are trying to take advantage of this great resource. And that's what we see now, but it's probably constantly changing and we get all these different species. There was a subtle thing in that question that I wanted to highlight. The, the, the way I heard the question, we were excluding the, um, you know, the, the morphology from, uh, uh, you know, preventing, say, a parasite coming along or an inquilin coming along. Uh, and that's that's where most of the of the hypotheses are centered in terms of the shape and structure of the galls. It's around um, it's around that area. Uh, so I it, it, I like the question because um, it just immediately excluded all of the or I shouldn't say all of a lot of the existing um, hypotheses <laughs> around the morphology. Okay, next question is what time of year? And this is regarding the Toyon. Oh, the Toyon. Um, see, I have that on iNaturalist. It's pretty well documented there. I think I saw it in May um, in that in that form. Uh, it may have been April. It was April or May, but I can certainly find that um, maybe uh, maybe when this presentation is over and, uh, and and point at the observation. Okay, sounds good. Next question is, um, it says, I'm confused, fungi and insect galls. Please explain they are so different. Well, my, my, my first thought on that, and, and Marav, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, but uh, gall is just a loose term. Like it's, it's, a, it's a label that we've applied to plant growth that has in, been induced by another organism for mm -hmm. the purposes of its reproduction. So there's also bacterial galls, um, you know, for example. So there are different, different organisms with different strategies that will manipulate plants for their own purposes in this way. Yeah, and they're completely not related. So yes, you can find an insect doing something somewhat similar to what a fungi would do, but the gall structure and the organism, it's very different. Great, that makes sense. Um, next question. Does the willow apple gall sawfly have an alternate generation? Does that generation live as a leaf roller, caterpillar rolled in a leaf edge? So that specific species only induce that specific gall. They only have that kind of gall, but other sawflies could have different things on willow. So on the same willow, you could find quite a few different galls and free living so fly lava and everything else. Okay. And this one says, I'm guessing that the red ones produce toxins. Can you say something about that? So probably not toxins, but well, I guess plant toxins, tannins, which make them unedible for most animals. Um, Cause probably the little lava inside doesn't want to end their life inside a big herbivore. Well, I, I never tried to eat a gall, but they should be pretty <laughs> nasty. <laughs> if anyone wants to try that. I've heard but stories. I, I don't recommend it, but I've heard stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question is how are galls related to leaf rollers and leaf miners? Uh, I might get into that just a little bit in the second half. Um, so whoever asked the question, if I don't cover it sufficiently, please ask it again. Okay. And, and I do think that I see lots of questions coming in. Um, we might 
want to what do you think Marav? a couple more yes. and then and then move no, on? maybe maybe let's go to the rest of the presentation then we'll have plenty of time to go over everything else okay so we'll pause here yeah and i will okay. uh, get sharing again all right Okay, does it look good? Oops, I hit everybody, so I can't tell if-, if Yeah, it that. looks good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so moving on. So let's talk now a little bit about finding galls. And in the course of talking about finding galls, I'll, I'll probably hit on a few things that Marav covered in the first half, maybe uh, from a different angle and, uh, and hopefully uh, reinforce some of the important points. So we've been showing a lot of colorful galls and nice photos, close-up photos of the galls, um, but that might make you think that that these are always super easy to find, and some of them are, but a lot of them can be hard to find at times, even the colorful ones. So to find the galls, I could just, again, sort of glibly say, look closely. And while that's true, it's not very helpful. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the strategies that I use and how to go about this. So for me, the first thing I, I have to do, and, and this might just be a limitation of my brain, but it's resonated with other people I've spoken to, I have to purposely switch my attentional filter. I have to make a conscious decision of how and what I'm looking for. And I become much more successful at that point. So sometimes I'll, I'll approach a plant. I know it's a good plant. Maybe it's a leather oak or a scrub oak or something like that. And I'll, um, envision a leaf gall and then I'll scan the leaves and that can help. And I'll look at, you know, the underside of the leaf and the top side of the leaf. And then I'll change my attentional focus perhaps to the stems. And then maybe I'll focus on, you know, if the plant has catkins or acorns or some other fruit or flowering body, I'll give it another pass looking at those. And for me, then, that seems to work pretty well. And I'll look for anything that just sort of stands out as abnormal. And you can see the photo here in the upper right. That's actually a tiny little gall um, on a um, coyote brush. You can hardly even see it. So you can see some of these are, are, are very small and will not stand out to you unless you're looking for them. But the you know, technique aside, you might be wondering where to look. And we already talked a little bit about this. A good place to start is with the plants. And using the resource that Marav mentioned earlier, there's an excellent book by Richard Russo. Uh, uh, what, um, it's a Western Gauls book. There's a website called Gall Formers. Even iNaturalist can be great to take a look and see what's being seen in your area. On iNaturalist, there's a number of gall projects that we'll show you a little bit later that you can dig into and see what's seen. Now. Here, these four galls are all fairly common on coyote brush here in California. And you can, in fact, you can occasionally find all four of these on one single plant. So that's an example. When I see a coyote brush, especially if I'm trying to find galls, I'll give it extra attention and you know I'll, I'll look for these. So recall this list here that Marav went through earlier. These are sort of the super um, hosts for galls. And these are the ones we tend to focus on. But I also wanted to point out that some of the most common galls that we see don't grow on these plants. There are some plants maybe that only support one or two or three species, but they're very prolific. And a really good example is shown here, the manzanita leaf gall aphid. And these will grow on all sorts of manzanita species and can be very noticeable. Uh, they can be very bright red, in this case, a little bit pink. Later in the year, they turn more brown but you can still find them even right now, even though maybe it's past their peak time. So these can be seen even by casual observation. You may have seen them yourself. And here's another really good example, I think. It's a midge gall on ethereal spear. This one here was seen at Laguna Seca in North Coyote Valley. And I've also seen these at Rancho Cañada del Oro, Coyote Ridge, and other locations. And sometimes this widening of the stem that we see here, it's so common you see it on so many of the individual specimens in the field that you almost start to think that's how the plant naturally grows and they can easily be overlooked. Galls can be found all year, but the best times, as Marav said, because of the reproductive cycle and the plant growth times, 
tend to be spring and then again in late summer and early fall. And here in the Bay Area, late summer and early fall produce the most vibrant species. I think that's when people get most excited. That's why we're here talking to you right now, in fact. Um, however, you can find galls all year, especially here in the Bay Area where we have long growing seasons and pleasant weather. So for example, even in winter, uh, you can find some of these, uh, some of these galls, but you know, in particular, I think in winter, it's a good time to look for more of the cryptic stem galls that might not stand out on a fully leafed out tree. Once the leaves are dropped, uh, you know, you can see those stems much, much better. Some of the rosette style galls that, uh, I think there was a picture or two earlier that occur will actually hang on to a, uh, a shrub or a tree longer than the leaves. And those will stand out a little bit more. And of course, the other thing is, you know, you walk around a lot of parks, the park management will trim low branches for safety reasons. So it can be hard to actually get your hands on or see up close some of these leaves that have all these amazing galls on them. But newly fallen leaves can be an opportunity to actually see some galls that you might not otherwise get to see. Now this data, this little graph here, I pulled it from the Galls of California iNaturalist project, and we'll make sure that you get the link to that later. It's, it's on the screen here too. So this is not exactly totally scientific, um, because it doesn't account for things like, uh, observation hour normalization or other things that might, uh, skew the numbers, but it does give you a rough sense that people are seeing galls all year. And there's a bit of a spike in the spring, but a bigger spike in the fall. And by the way, the reason, <laughs> the reason why that spike is so dramatic in the fall is partly because of gall week that Marav alluded to before that's Marav's brainchild to bring more attention to galls globally. Uh, she'll talk a bit more about that later, but all that extra attention means a lot more observations in iNaturalist and we're seeing those spikes. So there are so many undiscovered and undescribed galls that it's always worth looking at a plant through all those different lenses that I mentioned before. Uh, we talked about some of the terminology where you have leaf gall, stem galls, some galls grow on midribs, some grow on petiole, some, uh, some might grow on, uh, you know, a different part of the plant. So having those things in mind are important. It's important to look for abnormal things. And as I said, scan the leaves, the twigs, the fruits, the flowers, uh, just to, to see what stands out. And if you're looking for abnormal things on plants, inevitably you're going to get to a point where you will wonder if the thing you saw is actually a gall or not. And let me just run through some of those attributes again. So one thing to make note of is the location, you know, is it on that mid rib? Is it, you know, underside of the leaf, top side of the leaf? Is it growing actually through the leaf? Is it attached, uh, you know, to the plant and is it integral? Is it actually like, part of the stem as opposed to just attached to the stem. Um, most galls would be attached to some degree, but some could be brittle and easily fall off. But even if they fall off, there should still be a point where you can see the growth, uh, on the plant where it came from. Now, is this growth, is this thing that you're not sure of, is it different from other growth on the plant? Do you see a pattern? Uh, maybe there are similar structures in similar places across the plant. That's a good hint as to what might be going on. And it's not uncommon for a plant to have many instances of a gall. Sometimes you encounter, um, say a valley oak that's just covered in those, um, uh, red cone gall wasp galls all over the place. And then the next valley oak you see maybe doesn't have any, um, but, uh, but very often you'll see many, many instances of, of a gall on a plant, not always, but often. And then when you're looking at this thing that you're not sure, is there an exit hole or exit holes on it? That might indicate that there was something living inside that left. Now, if you don't see an exit hole, it might mean the thing's still in there. So, you know, none of these, none of these attributes I'm talking about are foolproof, but they're all things to make note of and help you build a picture. And then another question is, does it have a chamber inside or maybe even living larva inside? Now, of course, to investigate that way, you'd have to destroy the gall. You'd have to open it up. Uh, so you might not want to do that, uh, you know, but, uh, if you were to do that, that would give you additional hints and additional detail to help you figure this out. So we're going to play a few rounds of what I call gall or not a gall. 
And I've included some common lookalike things to keep in mind as we go through here. There was that question earlier about other, you know, leaf rolling and leaf folders um, and some, you know, a few other things here to keep in mind. So let's move on to this. And what I'll do is I'll give you a few seconds to deliberate. Obviously, you're not there. You're not able to touch it and, and see it from different angles and all this. So you're kind of at a disadvantage looking at just a two-dimensional photo on the screen, but we'll still play along. So back to this picture. What do you think, gall or not a gall? And as a hint, I'm pretty sure this was on a coast live oak. It looks like a coast live oak. So that is a good gall-inducing plant. And I'm going to tell you this one was not a gall. So even though the placement was in a location where sometimes we see galls, it wasn't attached. There was no indication that grew from the plant and it was moist. So there aren't very many galls that are moist. Marav did mention there are a few that will produce honeydew. That tends to be an exception. And what I think this thing here was is probably a berry. It probably fell from another plant, just happened to land here and not a gall. So let's try another one. So this one, it's kind of a twisted leaf. When I touched it, it felt pretty solid to me. It, you know, it wasn't crinkly. It wasn't like it was going to crush if I, uh, if I put too much pressure on it. And this one, the answer is it is a gall. And yes, some galls do induce a leaf curl or a leaf fold. And I'm using that word induce again, just tying into the question because the insect here, the cosmic moth actually caused the plant to grow this way. It didn't make it do it. It didn't use a mechanical means itself to fold the leaf. Oh no. Um, I don't know why it sometimes skips two slides at a time, but I just gave away the answer to this one. <laughs> if you were paying attention. So this was a leaf fold on a coast live Oak. And what I was going to say is if you look closely at it, you could probably figure this one out, whether it's a gall or not a gall, but I already gave away the answer because this double slide skip thing keeps happening to me. So it's not a gall. Um, you could actually see if you look really closely here, there's some silk almost like stitching. And this was made by a spider. In fact, it me used mechanical means to create this fold. It decided I want to live inside this leaf <laughs> or well, you know, at least have some part of my life cycle inside of this leaf. And it pulled the leaf over using this silk. And there are other insects that can fold in similar ways, uh, using mechanical means, as opposed to inducing the plant to grow that way. Okay. Now here's another one. I think you can probably figure out, especially if your video resolution is good and you can really see the detail here, but I, I am going to give you a hint. I touched this and it was hard and solid. So, uh, oh, that hint maybe was unexpected. And I'll tell you, this one was actually not a gall. It's desiccated spittle bug foam. So spittle bugs will create this foam as a mean of protection. And after it dries out, it actually can be kind of solid and hard and it can be deceptive. But when you look up close, the reason I said, if you have good resolution video, if this is coming through clearly, you can actually see little bubbles in there that dried into the desiccated foam. So that gives you an idea that it was a spittle bug that did this. Okay. I have a few more to go through. I hope this is helpful. So some, sometimes older galls don't look their best. This one here has some spider webs, some debris, some other things on them, and that can obscure it and, um, and make it hard to tell what's really going on here. This was seen on a eucalyptus species and you know, uh Oh, I'm sorry, not a native plant. <laughs> so please forgive me. Uh, but it is, uh, illustrative of the point that I'm trying to make. And, uh, the hint I'll give you on this one is it was extremely brittle. When I touched it very thin and it fell off super easily. So not a gall. Um, it was made by an insect called a red gum lerp psyllid, and it actually will excrete some honeydew that forms a bit of a protective cap over it. 
And like I said, it was extremely fragile. So most galls are going to be sturdy and to some degree. They may fall off easily, but the, the tissue walls of the gall will be sturdy enough that um, it provides more protection than this here would provide. Okay, I had to steal this picture from the internet because I didn't have a good example. This big growth is on an oak tree trunk. And it's actually not a gall, it's a, it's a burl. If you're familiar with burls, these are outgrowths that can occur on trunks or branches. They're often uh, instigated by an injury or stress or maybe even a fungal infection. But unlike galls, these aren't serving a reproductive purpose for any other organism. So burls, are, they're cool still to see regardless. And they're common on lots of different types of trees. You've probably seen them on like California bay trees or redwoods, even sycamores have them. Uh, there's one other type of burl that sometimes confuses people. And I guess technically it's not a burl, but it happens at the base of the plant. And it's called a lignotuber. And those appear to be genetically induced as opposed to gall induced. Again, they, there's no other organism that's inducing that sort of growth. Okay, so what about this one? Again, stolen from the internet. So it's structured, has an exit hole, and the common name is Mexican jumping bean. Some of you may know the life cycle of a Mexican jumping bean and already know the answer. And that answer is it's not a gall. So the Mexican jumping bean, it's actually a moth larva, moth larva. Uh, that creates it and the moth will lay its egg on on or near immature seed pods on the plant and when the eggs hatch the tiny larva will burrow their way into the seed pod and over time they consume the seed so the moth does use the seed pod as shelter and food kind of like a gall but it did not induce this growth it's just using what the plant was already producing so that's a difference between uh, a gall and this other uh, life cycle strategy that that this specific insect has. This one here, I think is super cool. It was on a Canyon live Oak. I've seen this a number of times. It's structured, it's hard, it's attached. And it's a trick. <laughs> so it's actually a scale insect. And the scale insect does such a good job of tricking people into thinking it's a gall that the common name of the family is gall-like scale insects. And, and there's a couple different ones that you might see uh, out there. So it's really interesting. And I don't know much about uh, any theories as to why they look so much like a gall, um, if there's uh, any, any rationale for that. But, uh, but these are really fun to find. They almost look like a, a planet, um, you know, in a way. All right, I think... This one might be the last gall or not a gall. So this green star-shaped structure was found on a California scrub oak. In fact, this is a very fresh photo. It was from just a couple weeks ago. And it is actually a gall. And in fact, it's one of those undescribed species. It, you know, we know it exists. It's been documented to exist. In fact, it's even in Russo's book that we talked about. Uh, but it hasn't been correlated to a specific documented species. So it's very likely, I don't know the very, you know, I don't know all the details on this one, but um, it's, it's likely that either an adult hasn't been reared or if one has been reared, it is waiting for a taxonomist to do all the work that's necessary to actually write the detail of the species. So at this point, we don't know exactly what it is. So the last example um, is really that the one I just showed an excellent reminder that there's a lot that still isn't known about galls. So Russo and, and Marav earlier mentioned that maybe only 75% of Western species are understood. I actually was surprised to see 75%. I thought maybe the number would be smaller than that. So there's a lot to be discovered and there are likely a lot of galls that we've been overlooking for decades. So here's an example straight from my own backyard. This is an undescribed midge gall that occurs on Frangula californica or California coffee berry. And despite being undescribed and hard to find, 
for whatever reason, this is very prolific in my backyard. Who knew? And, you know, I was curious about it. This is before I really knew a whole lot about galls. In fact, um, I cut one open to see what it looked like. I had so many, I, I thought I would do this for science. I would learn about what was inside, confirm it was actually a midge gall. And sure enough, you see inside, you know, you see the, the, the thickened um, walls and a bunch of midge larva inside. But maybe even more interestingly, was this one on the right, a very cleverly disguised fruit gall that I found on the same plant. In fact, I found this one almost exactly a year ago today. And to celebrate, I went out, I looked at my coffee berry today to see if I could find more. Unfortunately, no, I couldn't find any more. But uh, uh, this one here had not even been documented before, much less described. So this is like a brand new thing that was found just in my backyard. And I'm not saying that I'm special anyway. I'm just showing that if I could do it, like I think anybody could with close observation on the right plants. So since I couldn't find documentation on this gall in any of the usual resources, I decided, of course, I would add it to iNaturalist. I probably would have done that anyway, because I'm a bit of an addict when it comes to iNaturalist. And by doing so, it generated a bit of a discussion among various Bay Area naturalists who are interested in galls. And I think the outcome of me doing this was that literally just a few weeks later, a couple other naturalists found this same gall on San Bruno. So by seeing it, by having that mental search image, they were able to go find it and say, hey, this thing exists elsewhere too. So it's, it's real. And then I actually found it in Henry Co. just a few weeks after that. So now we know what to look for. And the next step is to try to rear it and, and then hopefully um, uh, find a taxonomist then if we can successfully rear it that can you know, properly identify it. So galls really are still a frontier in many ways. And for that and many other community science reasons, I really recommend documenting your finds on iNaturalist. And it can also help you in terms of identifying what you've seen. So I'll briefly talk a little bit about iNaturalist. I'm assuming most of you have used it before, or at least are aware of it. And if not, the super short summary of it is it's an app or a website that allows you to document observations and contribute to citizen science at the same time. It supports all types of living organisms. So it's not like specific to birds or plants or galls. You know, it's really anything, fungi, whatever you can think of, you can put on there. And it suggests IDs to varying degrees of accuracy. It's actually, it's getting much better all the time. And regardless, even if you don't trust the automatic suggestions that it gives you, you don't have to take them. You can just say, this is life, or this is a, a wasp or an insect or something like that. There's a community of people who are always out there seeking to lend a hand and help with identification. So if what you post has enough information to be identifiable, it's very likely someone will eventually come along and, and lend a hand. Now, when you do submit a gall observation, it's important to document the host species. So you can write it as a note, um, put it in the observation. I'll show you specific ways to do that. And to get even more visibility and increase your chances of someone coming along to help you, there are projects in iNaturalist. So you can go and add your observation to one of these projects. And there are more people that monitor those projects that will be likely then to see your observation and help you with an identification. There's also a field where you can annotate. Uh, there's this evidence of presence field that was just added uh, just a few months ago, maybe six months ago. And, and with it, you can flag it as a gall. And that's another way to get more visibility. And I mentioned that you can document the host plant that you found the organism on. And um, there's, there's a couple different fields. Unfortunately, th there's not one standard used in iNaturalist. So I often just default to filling both of them out, host plant ID and host, so that um, uh, you're covered and it's easy for people to find out exactly what it was you saw and where. Now, the other thing to, that I want to point out is in iNaturalist, there's also free form notes that you can add. So you can describe things. You can describe how it felt, how it looked, the size. You can take pictures with a ruler next to it or your finger in there to give a sense of scale. So there's lots of ways to make these observations uh, useful to the community science group. 
So with that, um, I'm going to hand it back over to Marav to wrap things up and I'll advance to the next slide. Thanks. So yeah, I just want to quickly mention Go Week. So last year we did Go Week um, for the first time in September. No, it was actually the first week of October. Um, yeah, and you can click the thing. Yeah, so um, another one. Okay, and we had people from 28 states and 15 different countries participating, which was very exciting because it just started out as like a little project on iNaturalist. Um, and this year we wanted to do another one, but to be a bit more inclusive. So I did this discussion with people from the East Coast and from uh, some European countries to see what time would work better for them. So we did it the first week of September and I think that worked well. Um, yeah, you can click on that. Uh, so it just ended a week ago or something like that with people participating from 35 states and 19 different countries. And it was really fun. We even had a T-shirt again. Um, and yeah, and we, we will share these links later with you guys so you could uh, explore and see what other people found. And it's just amazing to see the diversity of calls that people found from so many different places. And it's kind of fun to have you know, focus to go out and look for these goals for a week, even though uh, it didn't work well for us, I think, because it was in the middle of the heat wave. And um, yeah, that was kind of sad. But otherwise, it was fun. Okay. Um, so for Goal Week, uh, we organized a couple of events. I have my uh, website, Bioblitz Club. And if you don't know it yet, please come and visit. I have a couple of uh, flyers that you could download and print with uh, some of the most common goals you could find in the area, one for the fall, one for the spring. And you could print them and go out to the field and try and identify stuff. Because one of the things I really like about goals is that they're pretty easy to ID, um, especially if they don't have any parasites or anything like that inside, then they're pretty easy. Uh, I have all sorts of events. I mostly organize bioblitzes and sometimes insect walks and stuff like that. You can see that on the website. And then I think the next slide. Yeah, this is the last slide with some resources that we wanted to share with you. We use the Plant Gall book by Russo a lot to prepare this presentation. Um, and I should have probably said that in the first slide, we're not gall experts, but we just really enjoy uh, looking for them, documenting them, and sharing whatever we know with other people. So hopefully we didn't make too many mistakes, but if we did, it's just because, you know, we're still learning. Um, yeah, some good resources here. So this book, the book underneath is also a brilliant book that I highly recommend. I was kind of thinking, okay, botanist, you go out, you look for different things, you probably walk slowly, you look at the plants, and you probably notice all sorts of interesting things on the plant, on the plants. And this book by Charlie Eisman uh, is just wonderful. It has all sorts of little things you might find on plants and on different things and, and identify them. And then there's some really good resources for gulls. There's a website called Gull Formers, which is wonderful. Uh, Michael has some good podcasts uh, about goals and lots of other things, so please do check them out. Um, and I want to take thank Paul Heipel that you probably know, guy, uh, you know, and then Sarah Witt that helped preparing um, previous uh, versions of this presentation. So thank you. So I think we can take questions now. Great. Yeah. Thank you both. We have some really good questions. Uh, really appreciated. I like the, the, the fun uh, gall no gall and the macro photography is amazing. So thanks for all that presentation. Here are some of the questions. Uh, the first one, does inducing mean that the insect or fungi are genetically engineering the plants? Ooh, semantics. Um, <laughs> So when, when I hear engineering, that's like, I, I kind of translate that to intentionality. Um, so maybe if I discard intentionality for a moment, uh, it, th th there is um, a change in the genetic expression in some of these galls. Uh, I know there are some people I see, I saw the list of participants. I know there are some people who know genetics much better than I do. And Marav is probably one of them. So that's all I'm gonna say and uh, <laughs> see if Marav has anything to add. 
Well, this is actually the part I know least about. Um, but, and I think this connects to another question that was there. So it's not the goal in you. So let's say insects, just to make it more simple. Uh, so the insect is not the one creating the goal. It's just making the plant create the goal, okay? Uh, either by using, you know, mechanically chewing the plant or by, uh, you know, using some chemical compounds. And by doing that, they could change the net genetics of the plant and possibly other things. I, I'm not sure about that part. But the plant is then the one growing the structure. So that, which means that the gall is made by plant tissue, which is why it won't break so easily because it's just plant tissue, just like you cannot just, you know, break a leaf or a twig too easily. Um, yeah, so hopefully that maybe explained a couple of these questions. Okay. Yeah, and there's another pair of questions that relate to each other. It's basically, do the plants derive any benefit or detriment from the galls? And, oh yeah, there are a few questions about that. Yeah, so, and then the second part of that is, do gall-inducing organisms seek out mature species? So, um, by mature species, I guess mature plants. I think that's what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think, well, some galls definitely do benefit the plant because uh, the little nodules you find on um, plant roots that uh, have bacteria that, oh, I'm blanking on words here, but uh, bacteria that uh, connects to uh, nitrogen. Um, mm. Like a mycorrhizae or something? Yes. So these are yeah. considered uh, galls. So those are definitely uh, beneficial for plants and for so many other organisms on the way. Um, yeah, but then regular galls, you know, like the ones we see on the leaves, are probably not beneficial, but also not too bad for the plant. And you could see that oaks can support hundreds, if not thousands of galls on a large, you know, valley oak, for example, you can find many different species of galls and hundreds, if not thousands of some specific species like red cones. Um, it's probably not great for them because they have to <laughs> feed all these little parasites, but uh, it's probably not too bad unless the tree is not doing well. And then that could be a bit too much. Um, I think, you know, if, well, some of my trees in my yard have galls and I find that, you know, awesome. I think it's great to have all that diversity. I know that some people might not think that way, but I hope that people that grow native plants uh, do appreciate having native insects on them. Mm -hmm. um, I think they might slightly benefit the plant because some of these galls, the ones that secrete honeydew, again, um, they attract ants and wasps that constantly forage on these trees. So it's not all the galls, but specific species that secrete honeydew. And I think that helps the plant because the ants would also feed on herbivores. They would, you know, uh, mess up with all sorts of caterpillars and different insects that they find on the way. So they probably do help the plant uh, this way. I don't know if there are any studies that actually check that out, but some plants in the in the tropics, for example, are associated with ants. They attract them intentionally so that they can, um, you know, protect the plants from all the, these different pests. Mm -hmm. So this question's kind of related to what you were just talking about. It's, do you know how many apple galls will kill an oak? If, if we know it will kill an oak, even. So I don't know that they would kill an oak. Yeah. I think the oak should be in really bad shape to die from something like that. Michael, did, did you want to add something? Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I just, there, there was a interesting anecdote I was going to say from Charlie Eisman's book where the, you know, I, th I think it was Charlie Eisman's book, so I, I should really have this uh, written down so I can properly attribute it. But uh, he talks about how galls might actually be a way of calling a truce in the evolutionary arms race, uh, which I thought was an interesting way to think about it, where you have these insects who want to eat the plant, the plant who's coming up with defenses to stop the insect from doing that. And yet somehow they've come to this 
equilibrium in a way where the damage, if it is damage, I'll use that word, you know, loosely is contained to just a small spot and everybody gets what they want, you know, from it. So the damage is, is constrained and the insect gets to live its life, which is kind of an interesting way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's another YouTube question. Does the presence of galls say something about the host or the community? I wonder what they meant about that. Um, yeah, I mean, some plants. So, I mean, it's really interesting. And I think Michael mentioned that earlier, that if you go out looking for galls, you might see, you know, a few different uh, valley oaks, for example. And you start with the first one. It could be covered with red cones. The tree right next to it might have none of the red cones, but could have three other species. And then the third tree could have another mix of, of species. And we, we are not really sure why. Oh, and there was another question about the mature trees earlier. So often we would find galls on mature trees, but sometimes you'd also find them on little ones. Okay, so maybe, yeah, we don't know yet. And I'm not sure if there's like a, any, you know, um, preference to the age or the height uh, or, you know, there's, there's so many things we don't actually know. Right. Um, here's another one with Diastrophus kincaidia, I hope I pronounced that right, and it's host the thimbleberry occurring essentially only on the west coast and the northern Great Lakes basin. I've often wondered why. Do you have any theories? So I saw that question and I, I've, I've never noticed that before. I thought it was really interesting. So I searched on iNaturalist for both the host and uh, the gall. And both of them, very interestingly, have the distribution both in the Great Lakes and in the West Coast, uh, which is interesting. So I wonder why and how they moved, both moved uh, to these two very separate locations. I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know anything about that, but it is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Where do the gallers get the materials to build the structures? Oh, so that's the question I tried to answer earlier, that the yeah. plant is actually the making plants this The providing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Let me skip down here a little bit. Um, maybe this is kind of related to that other question is, why is there some strange disjunct stuff going on between Lake Superior and the West Coast? Does that kind of relate to the other one? Let's see. Tips on rearing galls. <laughs> I, I have never successfully reared a gall, so I'm not the one to provide tips. I've tried, and what what people have said. I've actually I've asked um, Charlie Eisman, <laughs> you know his his tips, and uh, it seems like it's some alchemy of uh, getting the right timing with the right amount of moisture in, um, you know, because if you if you remove the gall at the wrong time from the plant, it's no longer getting its source of nutrients from the plant. So you have to get it just right. Um, and a lot of these insects, I don't know that, that we stressed this point, but even the wasps, like you might imagine these big uh, yellow jacket size wasps when you hear that word, but these things are tiny. And, and Marav had some pictures, but they can be a couple millimeters or smaller, uh, you know, that, that you just, you know, could, you can't even like put a net or a bag or something over the, over the gall because they would escape if they were to, um, you know, come out. So yeah, it's challenging. I'm sorry. I don't have good answers, uh, but I would suggest going to people like Charlie Eisman and, and reading his blog. He has a really good uh, lengthy post about how to rear different insects, whether they're leaf miners or galls. And, uh, and that's what I've tried to follow. No success yet though. Um, Rav, have you done it? Uh, probably not intentionally. So, you know, from time to time, I, I had some galls here on my desk and I think stuff came out of it but um, yeah I think what he said about the timing is really important and then yeah the conditions I would definitely well, go to Charlie I guess the <laughs> other challenge with it is whatever comes out may or may not be the gall inducer right like it could have been um, you know the the parasitoid or an inquilin or you know who somebody else who just came along oh, the hyperparasite yes <laughs> that parasitized the parasitic wasp Yep. Yeah, because even, you know, the apple galls, these big apples we see on the valley oaks, they could have up to 15 different species of wasps emerging within two to three years. 
So there's the one that induced that and then a whole bunch of, you know, uninvited guests. Are there any specific inquilins attracted to specific galls or are they more generalists? Oh, good question. So yeah, they're highly specific. They're often very closely related to the one inducing the gall. So they're all gall wasps. They belong, if, I mean, if we're talking about gall wasps, then they belong to the same family as the one inducing the gall and closely related to that. And they should be highly specific because they need, that wasp needs to be able to find that specific gall and be able to lay their eggs in a way that they will get into the, the gall. Mm. So yeah, probably highly specific as far as okay. I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. All, let's see, I think, I think this is a continuation of a question. Did the wasps fly all the way to find more host plants or did two separate species evolve alongside it similarly? Is that the Great Lakes oh, in West yeah, Coast? Yeah, 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 that's what that refers to. Yeah, it's, it sounds really interesting to me. It sounds like another area ripe for research. I, I admit I had a bias, like um, this is not the way to do science, but, but my first thought was, uh, oh, this is probably actually two different species. And once somebody does a deep genetic analysis, they're going to figure that out. But I have no idea, actually. So. <laughs> okay. What kind of insects have galls on the California buckeye tree? Ooh, I don't know of any. Are there buckeye galls you know of? None as far as I know. I mean, some plants just don't have them. Or not that we know, mm -hmm. but probably because they're so toxic. Bay tree doesn't mm. have any that I know of. Buckeye is highly toxic. So okay. interesting. Uh, yeah. There are some herbivores that would feed on the leaves or other parts of the plant, but no mm. gall inducers as far as I know. Okay. Uh, let's see. And Vivian posted the iNaturalist. It's www.inaturalist.org slash projects slash galls dash of dash California. Um, somebody else asked who the author of the Western Gaul book is, and it was answered, Ronald Russo. And let's see, a couple other questions here. Is the red gum lerpsilid a native insect, or did it come in with the eucalyptus? I think it came from Australia. I, I don't think it's a native insect. Okay. Yeah, and, and there were a couple of questions about uh, gall inducers on different non-native plants. So usually those would be non-native species as well, because because this is coevolution. It took probably millions of years for them to coevolve that way. So that insect is highly adapted to that specific species of plant, and they must have arrived here from wherever that plant arrived. In this case, Australia, but there are many other cases, uh, like the pepper tree, for example, has a very common psyllid uh, gall on it, and both are non-native. Uh, and someone asked if native species could, uh, could then induce galls on non-native plants. And I think that's very unlikely unless these two species are somehow so closely related that uh, the insect or other creature could use both uh, plants. In general, that usually very specific to the species of host. But then, you know, some of these uh, organisms are less specific, like gall mites, they can use a few different uh, oaks, even non-related oaks. So maybe they could use a non-native oak, but even on the oaks, like the, the non-native oaks here have non-native gall wasps. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Interesting, yeah, yeah. And this one is, um, blue oaks tend to host a large diversity of leaf galls in the fall, but the trees are losing their leaves early, likely because of drought. Any idea how changes in plant seasonality may affect the galls who use them? I, I would think by default, if they're out of alignment, it would obviously be negative. My yeah. casual observation this year, and Marav, I, I think you and I were talking about this, uh, so many of the blue oaks that even do still have their leaves don't have the same number, the same um, abundance of galls that say I saw the year before or two years ago. So uh, it's something is going on, I think, but you know, it's a, it's an in of one at this point from a, <laughs> from a science standpoint. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to add that, you know, 
losing their leaves is part of the natural cycle of the oak. So the gods are adapted to that. But if it will happen earlier and they'll have a shorter lifespan, then yeah, it could definitely affect them. And mm -hmm. that'll be interesting to note. Yeah. And how much of the gall morphology is determined by the inducer and how much by the host? Ooh. I, one thing I'm going to say is I've noticed that for some galls, you see almost some echoes of the type of plant growth that, that occurs. So like the, the one I'm thinking of in particular is the gall wasp that affects some of our native roses. It's very spiky and you can almost see the echoes of the thorns, you know, from, from the plant. And, um, I, I'm just shooting from the hip. I don't know, like really if there's anything to that. But there are occasions where where you can you can kind of see some of that, but it's the plant that's doing it, and the um, the inducing that's happening by the by the organism, um, you know, is is what's been worked out through those millions of years of of attempts and and trying. Um, so it's it's really hard to say uh, exactly what's going on there. Okay. Yeah, but it's a it's a cool question. I mean, I think. Maybe one way to look at that is to look at a species, same species of gall inducer on a few different host plants, because sometimes that happens, like with these white oaks. So you can find spine turban, those cute little pink stars, both on a valley oak and on a scrub oak, but they don't look anything alike. They, they're pretty different. Uh, they kind of look like a chewing gum on, on <laughs> a scrub oak. So maybe that's where the host plant impact is seen this i don't know it's definitely the two together right like it's not it's not just yeah. one or just the other yeah 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 and this question relates to it it's it's have researchers simulated the plant's gall response without an insect that sounds like a really cool project i don't know yeah <laughs> sounds really neat uh, we have just a couple more questions. We're almost at nine o'clock here. Um, we have um, a few people who've posted the BioBlitz website, which is www.bioblitz with a B L I T Z dot club. And let's see. One person asks, "How can you tell apart the four galls on the coyote brush? And once again, are they harmful to the plants that we know of?" Mm, so the I don't know if I if I can quickly pull that slide back up. Um, do you want to start describing Marav and I'll find the slide and mm -hmm. share it? Sure. So I think Caddy Brush is a great plant to start with because it's such a common plant in the Bay Area. And uh, just like we showed earlier, it has galls from very different gall inducers, like the fungus, the moth, the aphid, you know, all these different things, uh, the midge. Um, you could tell them apart by looking at the area, the, the part of the plant that has the gall. So one or some of them are on the stem, some are on the leaf, some are on the plant bud. Okay, so yeah, the one on the right is on the plant bud. You could see the leaves sticking out of it. Uh, and that's when it's fresh and green. Then, you know, they turn kind of brown, but you could still see like a little blob with the exit holes later on. And then the leaf is is the leaf, and it has the it's called blisters. It's like little bumps on the leaf. They're very small and, and difficult to find. And then uh, the stem could have the rust gall, which is really cool when it's fresh. It's bright orange. It doesn't look like anything else. And uh, after a while, the the orange part, which is uh, probably the spores, the rust, the fungus, uh, will disappear. But you can still see that the stem was changed by something. It's kind of swollen, it's weird, um, but still alive. And then the moth uh, creates this pretty large stem gall in the middle of the stem, but there are other stem galls on coyote brush. So you kind of need to look at the shape and, and where it is on the plant. But just like anything else, you know, you start looking, you, you could take photos and upload to iNaturalist, but you could just start looking and, and make your observation. And then uh, the more you look, it will kind of make more sense. You'll start and differentiate these different structures and, and then it gets very easy. Great, thank you. 
Um, one last question, I think, um, is about the redwood and the tan oak, which both have lots of tannins in them. And this person's wondering, is that why they don't get as many galls because of the tannins? So uh, tan oak actually does have uh, leaf galls uh, induced by uh, mites, probably, I think. Oh, no, unknown, I think. It's one of these undescribed species. But um, yeah, redwoods, as far as we know, don't have any galls on them. And yeah, I mean, plants with high tannins or other um, compounds like that could could actually work <laughs> and deter the insects mm -hmm. and the other creatures. And I just realized real, real quick uh, that that website, Gall Formers, that we mentioned, they actually the, the whole gall or not a gall discussion they are starting to introduce gall lookalikes onto that website as well so uh something else to keep in mind if you're if you're curious they are covering some of these things that i covered here that look like a gall but but are not so nice. it's a great resource yeah great yeah and then one person posted the website um for eisman's rearing insects it's bug tracks dot wordpress.com slash rearing. That's the one. And relating to that, um, I think is kind of the last question here, which is basically, is there any way to get an email out to people with links or somehow get those posted in a way that we can share them with people? And I don't know if you have ideas about that, Vivian. I was going to just suggest that people get a copy of the chat. So if you can okay. do that yourself and you do that, down at the bottom well my screen is the bottom right like at, underneath the participant list there's a dot 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 and if you click on that it will say save chat is one of the options so you could save the chat and um and yes i see that robin's also saying the chat doesn't have all the resources that we talked about um we can probably copy some of these yeah. links to the um youtube uh, presentation and then it will be there as a comment or something like that or I don't know if you can add that yeah I could probably add that in the description yeah we if you send me the a, link and yeah. then we can add more in the comments if needed yeah so if you could do that um, I can put sure. that in the description and um, I hit Great. Marav up to do a, a walk with us sometime in the near future. And Michael is also willing to join and it will probably be on a weekday, but um, I will be sending that information. Once we figure out the date and time, I will send everybody who registered for Zoom information about that. And we'll post it on our, in, in all the usual places. If you're not that news um, mailing list notification, we'll send it on that. So if you're not subscribed to our news mailing list, that would be a good way to find out once we figure this out. And um, I think that was all I had to say other than <laughs> to thank both Marav and Michael so much for doing this talk. It was really fascinating and wonderful. I'm so happy we were able to make this happen. And many thanks to Stephanie and Barbara and Madeline, who was helping for a while, but she actually has COVID and uh, had to sort of <laughs> take, take a break. So Thanks for to Barbara for stepping in at the last minute to back Madeline up. Um, anyways, and thank all of you for showing up and sticking around and asking lots of great questions. Yeah, thank you for the great questions and the fantastic presentation. Very interesting and unique. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. Okay, folks, so this is it, and I'm going to be ending the session now. So good night, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.